first, let me apologize on behalf of my colleague, Dan Zelenczyk, who unfortunately was unable to attend the conference. Uh, since Danny is uh, the more computational uh, partner of the two of us, my talk will focus on uh, conceptual and uh, literary aspects rather than uh, computational, algorithmic, and mathematical issues, um, despite its uh, somewhat uh, technical title. So uh, let's start. When one, when one analyzes an in individual sentence apart from its context, wrote Mikhail Bakhtin in an unfinished article published only after his death, the traces of aggressivity and the influence of the anticipated response dialogical echoes from other preceding utterances, faint traces of changes of speech subjects that have furrowed uh, uh, the utterance from within, all this are lost, erased, because they are all foreign to the sentence as a unit of language. All these phenomena are connected with the all of the utterance, and when this all escapes the field of vision of the analyst, they cease to exist for him. Herein lies one of the reasons for that knownness of traditional stylistics. The stylistic an analysis that embraces all aspects of style is possible only as an, as an analysis of the all utterance, and only in that chain of speech communion of which the utterance is an inseparable link. Traces, influences, dialogical echoes, all the things that make human interaction so complex and so difficult to formulate, all the things that give Bakhtin dialogue theory its famously interpretive and philosophical power. There are many passions behind the attempt to translate a literary work into a, comp a computational framework, and in our case, a computational network. One of the main ones, which corresponds to what we have just read in Bertin, is to see the communication, the communication system in the work as a whole. To see that inseparable link that sometimes gets lost through reading. Ideally, the literary network, as clarified by Moretti, sees everything. When we watch a play, we are always in the present. What is on stage is, and then it disappears. Here, in the network graph, nothing ever disappears. What is done cannot be undone. The past becomes past, yes, but it never disappears from, from our perception of the plot. However, existing methods are quite limited in terms of capturing this totality. Computational systems, literary networks, see a lot, yes, and see well, but, like us, they cannot see everything. For justified practical reasons, they suffer from the same narrowness that prevents them from seeing the phenomenon in its multidimensional complexity. What binds two characters to one another? The communication that happens between them? Their being on stage together in the same scene? What about their silences or their physical gestures? What about references to them made by other characters? What about indirect connections created by analogies or contrasts between seemingly unrelated characters? What about connections mediated by, by figures outside the novel, from other novels, from literary history, from mythology? Similar to World Cloud, then, Typical graphical representation of social literary networks are an excellent way of looking at the whole, but only if the whole is considered as flat and limited, quantitatively and qualitatively, within the parameters that, distingu the, that distinguish its, from its different aspects from one another, not more than that. Traditionally, the most common literary network is based on co-occurrences. If characters appear in the same scene, they are linked. A wonderful example of, of, of this can be found in the uh, Draco project, which, among its other astonishing, astonishing capabilities, displays the work, display 
sorry, this plays a network of each play in its corpus. As all the plays are well TI encoded, and as all of them, and as all of them are obviously plays and not novels, it is quite easy to divide the text into scenes or acts and to identify the characters present in each. For example, here is Lessing, Nathan der Weiden, and here is Schiller's Die Räuber, written in almost the same year. Clearly, two different networks, two different poetics, I would say. Very impressive, very doable. A bit less doable is extracting networks from novels. But the common method is basically the same. If characters appear in the same sentence, paragraph, or text window of a given length, which replace the encoded fixed scenes in place, they are linked. Other methods are based on counting direct communications between characters, or what Denise Corinthian and, other, um, and others uh, called conversational networks, which, which are, as Corinthian showed, more difficult to extract automatically. The question is, however, how to move from the more or less doable and definitely desirable to the even more desirable, to a deeper conceptualization, conceptualizing, sorry, of filtering networks, getting as close to their multidimensional essence as possible, and a better understanding of their place in literary theory and history. To begin with, we wanted to see if word embedding algorithms such as word vec could help, since they are able to identify hidden connections between words that may be far apart in the text, or may even be taken from different texts. As these algorithms are able to identify a connection between words like milk and yogurt, Paris and London, king and queen, based on their hypothesis that words that appear in the same context tend to have similar meanings, when similar meaning is measured by cause and similarity, our question was whether they could recognize links between literary characters in the same way. The initial answer is that, to a certain extent, they can. The outcome is a graph of what can be called, though not to the fullest sense of the term, a semantic network of literary characters. While it is not always clear what kind of semantic of semantics connects connect two characters, and while it is undoubtedly biased by co-occurrences of characters in the same text window, it nevertheless succeeds in pointing out hidden connections between seemingly unrelated characters. Yet, as we will see, it requires reframing. As Hebrew literature scholars, we decided to focus on the work of the Israeli writer Amos Oz, who wrote about 25 novels over nearly 50 years. A sizable corpus, but not too large, and one that reflects a relatively long development process. Besides having Oz archive at our disposal, we also chose him because character interactions play a central role in his writing and his scholarship dedicated to it, and, above all, because of his status as one of the most translated Israeli writers, allowing us to process his English translations using useful packages such as Book and LP, which are incom incomparable to what is currently available in Hebrew. And as we heard yesterday, working with uh, translated text is not necessarily a bad idea. The protocol that we have used for each translated novel so far has been the same. After pre-processing the text to prepare it for computational analysis, we A, automatically created a co-occurrence network, B, automatically created a world to vex semantic network, and C, manually created a conversational network. For the, for the purposes of, of, the, of this talk, I will not go into detail on the technical questions and problems we had to address over time, such as how to find the right window size, a fairly easy, simple task, how to control vector size, another easy task, whether to train the model from scratch or not, a bit more complicated, or even what to do with first-person narrator's novel, well, ignore them. After extracting world to vec networks of pharmacist novels, we obtain graphs like this. 
Visually, they look the same. Literary networks in which the edges do not represent co-occurrences, but some kind of semantic connection calculated by, by the degree of course and similarity between characters, or more precisely, between the textual context of each character. This certainly offers a different perspective of the role of each character in the network, and a lot of data, for sure. But how can a literary scholar read it? What insights can be gained from analyzing it? Answering this question, another idea came into mind. Instead of using different methods, methods as a source of validation or as a means to clean trashy networks, what if you read them together at one and the same time? Here, for example, are two different graphs of a perfect piece. One of the most important, sorry, one of the most important um, novels of Oz. The left one is a world to vex semantic network, and the, and the right one is, co is a co-occurrences network. Even without going into detail, it is clear that each one of them tells a different story. And it is very interesting to compare them. But what, what if we put them one on top of the other and calculate, calculate the gaps between them? The result is a graph like this. Let me explain what we are looking at now. This graph is a combination of the two previous ones, and it is visualized as a heat map. The nearer the color of the edge is to red, the stronger is the semantic connection over the co-occurrences connection. The nearer the color of the edge is to blue, the stronger is the co-occurrence connection over the semantic connection. The network graph is full of triangles. Those that are predictable, such as love triangles or ideological triangles in a novel where love fights ideology, tend towards the blue. Those that are less predictable, but nevertheless contribute significantly to the balance of tensions in the novel, tend towards the red. Interesting. But here is the main conceptual point. This output, which we call a teaser, is given to the literary scholar, asking him or her, does this make sense for you? And please, mind the gap. What can you learn from the discrepancies between the two measurements? Theoretically, it is possible to add more and more layers to the integrated graph. And to do so based on different computational methods, as well as man manual ones, opening up a world of endless interpretive possibilities, solid or thought-provoking. This is precisely the purpose of the tool we are building now. Obviously, such a method, which can be regarded, regarded sorry, as an undogmatic heuristic, only applies in the context of close reading, for better or for worse. This method is excellent for analyzing one novel in depth or several novels in depth. It is excellent for analyzing relationships within a well-defined small corpus or even as a basis for broader conceptual abstractions. When you want to analyze large systems, however, it becomes less useful. The dream of identifying cross-book connections and relationships following Bartin has not yet been realized. In this case, we propose taking a step back. Let us put multi-layered modeling aside for a moment and instead enjoy word embedding practices to identify connections between distant texts, which in turn can also be used as another layer. Other groups have made similar attempts recently, but our approach is different as you will see immediately. Here, for example, is a calculation of word to vec based similarities between characters of five different novels by Amos Oz. This time, we see characters' names with colors, each color representing the book in which the character appears. This data is not represented as a network, but as a two-dimensional projection 
of a multidimensional network. Characters with higher cosine similarity are closer to one another. There is no surprise at all that characters in one novel tend to be close to each other. But this is not always the case. Sometimes a character from one novel may be more semantically related to a character from another. Again, this finding does not stand alone. It requires the interpretation and explanation of an experienced research researcher familiar with all the novels. But it does bring us a little closer to the vision described earlier. And here is another way to look at this. In this illustration, the strength of the connection between characters decreases from top to bottom. While the upper area of the illustration, as you can see, is naturally dominated by pairs of characters from the same novels, the lower area reveals interesting affinities between pairs of characters from different novels. Again, a teaser, food for thought for the researchers, for the researcher who can decide what to do with it, if at all. Of course, just as you can compare books by the same author, you can also compare them, compare, sorry, compare books by different authors. An experiment which will not be demonstrated here. But even if we restrict ourselves to one author only, this method can give us fascinating insights into his own literary history. The case of Famous Souls, for instance, shows that, on average, novels that are close together chronologically are also closer together semantically, more so the novels that are further apart, a finding that informs us a lot about his creative process. Sometimes, however, sharper insights are revealed. Take a look at this matrix, for example. In most novels, semantic similarities between characters maintain some sort of average, no average level, but the first novel shows variation. By mistake, it's not represented as the first, but as the second, but it is the first. Oz seems to have had to reinvent himself after his debut novel, at least when it comes to arranging the, the relationships between his characters. In the historiography of Oz, this insight is of great importance. Cynthia has recently been described as a writer who tested bold poetic and thematic possibilities at the beginning of his, of his career and suppressed them as he advanced towards canonization, canonization and towards the status of a national writer. Time to conclude. The desirable became, at least partially, also doable. Click and Fisher showed how by refining existing literary networks methods, new real poetic discoveries can be achieved. In their case, it was the transition from static to dynamic networks, which are more sensitive to plot developments. Following them, we too propose adding new elements, such as semantic network, multi-layered network, cross-books networks, to this well-established area. However, the main question for us is how to describe it, or the so what question. We believe that reframing the, com the computational product as a teaser for experimental human heuristics seems particularly important and appropriate both for the title of the conference, collaboration and as opportunity, and for the current stage of computational literary studies. The field has passed the stage of big conceptual promises that weren't always realized. And at the moment, with the tremendous progress of language models, it appears that overconfidence in technology may lead to a pyrrhic victory. Our proposal is therefore to maintain a tension, a balanced tension, between distant and close readings, two meaning-making ways whose connections are anything but trivial. Thank you very much.